You know, raising the bar, that's an interesting thought. That's what I want to think about today. When I was at Kathleen High School, I was on the track and field team. And uh, I think Coach Bailey, who was uh, a member here, was, was our coach. And we only had seven of us my junior year. Of course, one of them was Jimmy Pearson, those that remember back in those days. He was so an outstanding athlete. And uh, so we always did good because of him. But because there was only seven of us, and it was a track and field, Coach Bailey said, I want you all to figure out what field part you, you want to be a part of. You know, the shot put or the discus or the high jump or the long jump or the pole ball. And we were to try out every one of those to see which one we were good at. Well, when it came to me, it, it ended up being none of the above. But I tried out all everything. And I, when I got to the high jump, you know, they started at a, at a, a fairly low level, and, and I could do that, but they weren't able to raise the bar very high before I would hit it. When I went to the pole vault, I determined after a few tries that only crazy people did the pole vault. I never had to raise the bar at all because I never got over the minimum, the lowest they could put, bring the bar down to. I never got over that. Uh, it was uh, uh, no raising the bar there. But to raise the bar, that means to gradually set higher standards in order to reach an objective of excellence. You want to reach an objective of excellence in the Christian life? This morning I want to encourage you to think about the areas of your life that you might need to raise the bar. And here's one of the best news. And it might sound crazy. But the more that you raise the bar in your Christian life, the easier it gets. Now that sounds crazy, doesn't it? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some scripture from the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, 6, and 7, there's recorded this, this sermon that Jesus made as he, as he sat down on a mountain and looked down on, on a large crowd. And he shared these messages. And out of these messages are principles for those who follow Jesus. These are expectations of Christ followers. Expectations of disciples of Jesus. And some of the principles there kind of help us raise the bar in our own Christian life. And one of the principles is listen to the Lord more than the world. Listen to the Lord more than the Word. In the last part, the last verses of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus has five teachings in a sense that start with the idea, you have heard it was said, but I say unto you. An example of that is Matthew 5, 43 through 44. It said, you have heard it that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I, enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So Jesus took basically what the people that he was talking to, what they lived by, the standards they lived by, the principles they lived by, and he raised them all. He said, for example, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. But he says, but I say to you, don't even think it in your mind. He said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, don't even look on a person with lust in your heart. See, he raised the bar. And he says, listen to me. Listen to me. You know, and that's kind of what we need to do. We need to understand that there's a lot of voices in the world. You know, back in, in the people that Jesus was talking to, the voices that were here were, were pretty decent voices. The voices that we're hearing today, 
Sometimes they're decent, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's wholesome, sometimes it's not. I think you and I hear a lot more voices than they do. Because we have so much access to so much different kind of communications that we're almost confused by the amount of noise that we're hearing, of the amount of ideas that we're hearing, opinions that we're hearing, or thoughts that are being passed on concerning everything. And so, I, I, one of the things that Jesus is saying to us is we need to begin to distinguish between the voice of truth and the voice that's false, or the voice of the world and the voice of God. There's a, there's a song that was written by uh, Casting Crowns and sung like uh, the beginning of, of this century in 2003, I think, called The Voice of Truth. It says the voice of truth tells of a different story. Out of all the voices calling out to me, I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth. Because Jesus, you are the voice of truth. So if I'm going to raise the bar in my Christian life, I've got to learn to distinguish in the areas of ethics and morals and, and belief and trust in God and and, and integrity, all these things, all elements of my life, I've got to learn to listen to what Jesus says. You've heard it said, but I say you. And we need to be discerning what God says. It's a little bit like the, the shepherd and the sheep. The sheep get to the point to where they can hear the voice of the shepherd. You know, a lot of noise, a lot of maybe a lot of people talking, but when the uh, the shepherd speaks, that they hear that voice, and we need to be like the sheep of the shepherd. We need to learn to hear the voice of Jesus amidst all the noise, amidst all the the, the ideas, amidst all the opinions. We need to hear the voice of truth, and we need to listen to the Lord more than the world. A second principle is depend on the Lord more than yourself. Depend on the Lord more than yourself. In Matthew uh, 6, 7 through 13, in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, we have what is oftentimes referred to as the Lord's Prayer. It wasn't really Jesus' prayer as much as, as maybe later on, but right then it was kind of an example prayer. He's teaching his disciples how to pray. And in the midst of that, he says, give me this day my daily bread. Pray, pray this, Lord, give me this day my daily bread. So who are we depending on for daily bread? We depend on the Lord. Later on in that same prayer, he said, deliver me from evil. Who are we depending on? For victory over sin in our life is the Lord. And, and the more that we understand our relationship with God, the more that we understand that we are to depend upon Him for strength. We're dependent upon Him for everything. Physical needs, but also even above that, the spiritual needs in my life and in your life. You see, when you become a Christian, it's like you enter into a relationship. In fact, it's not like it. It's what you do. You enter into a relationship with God. Now think about that relationship. Who's the strong one in that relationship? Who's the wise one in that relationship? Who's the most experienced in that relationship? Who's the holiest in that relationship? And all the answers are God. He's so far superior than we are. At any point in time in our life, He's so far superior than we are. Why would we depend upon ourselves when we can depend upon Almighty God? We've entered into a relationship with Him. And He gives us a wonderful invitation. This is one of the most wonderful verses in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 11, 28-30, He says, Come to Me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle 
and humble in heart. He's talking about himself. And you will find rest in your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, I said earlier, the more you raise the bar, the easier it gets. It seems like, you know, in, in any, anything else in the physical world, the more you raise the bar, the harder it gets. But the more you raise the bar in the Christian life, the more you become dependent upon the Lord. And it actually is easier. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. We make it hard because we, we look to ourselves in our weakness rather than God in His strength. And we need to learn to come to Him. And so we get tired. We, we get overwhelmed. We get stressed. And a lot of that is because we are not coming to Him. We're not accepting the invitation. Come to Him and find rest. Find peace. Find calm. Find confidence. Because of who He is. Because you've taken the yoke. You know, you have two oxen. They're pulling. They're, they're kind of carrying the same weight. But the yoke with God... Who's carrying the weight? Why are you carrying the burden when you have God yoked with you? There's a group called Elevation Worship and they have a song that says, Oh, come to the altar. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink at the well? Jesus is calling. Leave behind the regrets and mistakes. Come today. There's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is brought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We need to come to the altar. We need to come to the one that invited us. Oh, you that are weary and heavy laden, that you're going through your life and you're trying your best in your best effort to live the Christian life and you're tired, you're broken, you're beaten down. Come to the altar. Come to Jesus. He's calling. He says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. Come and find rest. And we need to accept that invitation. That's not just an invitation for salvation. That's an invitation to the Christian. Come and find your strength in Him. The Christian life is a life of leaning on Jesus, learning to lean on Jesus, learning to depend upon Him, learning to understand that He is strong and I am weak and I need to trust in Him and rest in Him and find my strength in Him and find my guidance in Him and my direction in Him. He is God and I am not. And so we need to begin to understand that raising the bar means that we depend more and more upon the Lord and less and less upon ourselves. We come to Him and we find our rest in Him. Some of you know my, my uh, son-in-law is Brock Gill. He's a Christian illusionist. He's been in the church. And uh, recently he's been doing some interviews for a... Uh, uh, a British TV company. They're gonna. Uh, they're putting together a TV show, and he's been the the host. And uh, one time he had three other illusionists, Christian illusionists. It was so interesting. We've already seen this. Uh, we hadn't seen any others, but we saw this. And uh, he had three other Christian illusionists, and he knew all three of them. And he's interviewing these guys, and they've all risen to the point to where they're they're pretty big in in, in their own individual. Uh, job, you might say. They, they, they've been very successful. But as he's interviewing them, it was so interesting because every one of them had, a, had something in their background that was a huge barrier. One of them has tourists. It's amazing. And he's a public speaker. He's a, he's, he's a public, you would call him a Christian entertainer, but he's, he's an evangelist. And one of them had a, had a physical uh, 
disease or ailment to where he could not talk until he was 15. He could talk, but it'd take about 15 minutes to get one word. Now think about a conversation just to say hello. How long would it say that hello my name is? You're not going to stand around for an hour. So he just didn't talk. And here's a man that now stands in front of huge crowds. And, and God uses him to, to share the message through this, through this tool. Then there was another uh, magician who came from Afghanistan when he was a child. And as a young child, going through this change of culture and change of area, his, his father was violently killed, I believe, in his, in his presence. And, and to grow up in this new culture with a fatherless life, and yet God used him and, and Brock himself uh, has uh, ADD uh, before they knew what it was. You know, before they knew what it was, you were just one of those troubled kids that was not going to mount anything and that's kind of how you were treated. So here are these four guys that God is using in marvelous ways and all of them have uh, such huge obstacles in their life that are al almost abnormal. But you know, I began to think about that and said, you know, one of the things was it was almost an advantage to them because they did not depend upon their own ability. They did not depend upon their own skill. They had started out from the get-go, if I'm going to do this, I've got to depend upon the Lord. And some of the times we have to learn that. But that's the truth of the matter. To live the Christian life, you need to learn to depend upon God. He's the strong one. He's the wise one. And so, as a Christian, we come to Him. And we find our strength in Him. And we find our rest in Him. And so, one of the principles that, that to raise the bar is depend upon the Lord more than yourself. And a third principle that I think we can... Glean from the, the Sermon on the Mount to raise the bar is focus on the eternal more than the temporary. Focus on the eternal more than the temporary. As a Christian, you become a citizen of the kingdom of God. And Jesus becomes your king. See, we need to understand that that's, that's something that happens when you become a Christian. It's more than just being saved and getting into heaven. You, you become a kingdom citizen. And, and, and so the, the things that Jesus says in Matthew 6, 7, and, and 5, 6, and 7, and, and the, what the Bible says, these are expectations not for other people. These are expectations for you and me. So our whole worldview, our whole mindset should change. It takes a while sometimes to get on to this, but, but the idea is we have become a part of something that is eternal. Forever. And what we have, had been a part of was just temporary. And so our priorities ought to change, our, our thinking ought to change, the way we, we view our life and what we want to do with our life ought to change. In Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 20, Jesus said, Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in, or still. So he's saying, you know, as a Christian, one of the things you have a, an eternal, forever world, and you've got a temporary world, you've got a permanent world, a temporary world. So where am I going to invest my life in that which is permanent, in that which is eternal? So he says, don't, don't. Build your life around storing up for yourself treasures on earth because you can't take them with you. 
because they're not permanent. They, they, the moth and rust destroy the bees breaking and steal. They're, they, they're here and they're gone. But he says when you become a Christian and you become a part of the kingdom of God and you're serving your king, you can do something that lasts beyond the grave. Store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and thieves do not break it and steal because it cannot be touched. It's not earthly. It's not worldly. It's eternal. It's spiritual. And what happens in your life is you begin to understand. You can begin to, to realize that I'm more about heaven. I begin to think more about heaven and, and I begin to think more about the kingdom of God and, and what advances the the kingdom agenda. In 1 John 2, 17, the world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So what's temporary and what's permanent? And when, as we begin to raise the bar and our life becomes more about the kingdom of God and the treasures of heaven, then the things of earth begin to get strangely dim, as the song says. It kind of fades away in importance. And all the things that we were stressed and worried about, all of a sudden they're not such a big deal anymore. Because I've got my mind on something greater, something bigger, something more lasting. And when that happens, all the chaos around you, all of a sudden, it doesn't seem as big a deal. I mean, we're in the midst of a lot of fretting, a lot of stressing, a lot of anxiety. And it's not just a, the, the pandemic, it's not just the protests, and it's not just the politics, it's, it's all of it combined. And, and we all have concern for all these things. But the fact of the matter is, as a Christian, it's kind of like, I care, but I'm not stressed, I'm not worried as much. Because my home's in heaven, I'm just kind of passing through here. And so I'm not as attached to this world and the things that are happening in this world. Pam and I, over the years, we've gone to Ecuador, we've gone to Bolivia, we've gone to Peru. I've gone to other uh, nations on missionary journeys, but these, uh, these ones in South America, we went to see our missionary kids. And it's interesting, some of the, some of the worlds that they're living in uh, and some of the things that are happening in their world are so different from ours. We were down in Ecuador. We only went to Ecuador one time. They were down there for just a short period of time. And they, they, uh, we were in this uh, hotel and we heard this yelling and screaming and stuff. And, and, and people marching down the street. They were having protests. <laughs> we know what that's like. They were having protests. And, uh, all, you know, and a lot of people were upset. And they kind of said, be careful, you know, when you go out at night, there might be extenuation things. This was in a, a place called Wyke Hill. And a uh, beautiful little town down there. So it was interesting, though. It was like, it was like their problem. It wasn't, it wasn't our problem. We were going home. We were, we were only going to be there a short while and, and, and we were a little bit concerned about what was happening with them but, but it wasn't like we were overwhelmed by it because we were just passing through. We went to Bolivia one time and we went there a lot more times. Uh, there was uh, Trent and Kay and the kids were stationed down in Bolivia uh, a lot longer. And uh, Bolivia is an interesting country there's not that many major roads that go through it. And when they have protests down there, when they have, uh, what they do is they block the roads. I mean, they literally block the roads. You know, in the protests now, they try to block the interstates, and, and, and sometimes they succeed at that, but most of the time, that's just not going to go. Down there, that's a practice, that's a common thing. 
We were in Cochabamba. The very first time we were there, we were going over to Sucre where Trent and Kay were, were living and we were, we was dark and we'd tired. We'd been driving most of the day and we we're talking about what we're gonna eat when we're getting there. We could see the, the lights of the city of, of Sucre and, and all of a sudden it's kind of like, we're in a traffic jam. And Trent said, uh-oh. We were in a blockade. We said, well, what does that mean? It says, well, we're stuck. They blockade for days. They put rocks in the middle of the road. They, they camp out in the middle of the road. They have campfires in the middle of the road. We, we slept in the, in the car and then walked to the blockade the next day. But what was funny, it was like, it was like we're standing there and this is a huge thing for, for their nation and, and it's like for us, it's like, no big deal. Well, why not? Because we're just, we're visitors here. We're, we're this isn't our home. We're going home one day. This is kind of their problems. When you become a Christian, you're on your way home. And, and I'm not saying that you don't need to get involved in the things of this world. I'm just trying to say that you need to be more eternal than you are worldly. Right? When you are earthly. That you need to look more to the eternal than you are the temporary. And the things of this world you're not so caught up in. In the midst of the chaos, you have come because you're just passing through. This in your home. Just like we were just visiting in Ecuador, we were just visiting Bolivia, we knew that this was going to be very temporary and we're going to be back home. This is the way the Christian, in a sense, looks at this world. We're like on a huge mission trip. This is not our home. When you become a Christian, you become a citizen of the kingdom of God. Jesus is your king. Heaven's your home. And you're passing through. And yes, you want to make an impact. Yes, you want to tell people about Jesus. Yes, you want to, you want to help uh, with every kind of situation that you are. But at the same time, you have this kind of otherworldliness. Like, this is, this is an issue that I'm concerned about. This is something I want to do something about. But I'm not caught up in it. The world around is in chaos. But I'm calm because I'm going home. I'm just passing through. And you see how that makes your life easier when you raise the bar and you get to the point to where you're thinking more spiritually minded, heavenly minded. You're on your, your way home. You're made for eternity. You're, you're living this life in preparation for that life. And the more that we get that idea in our hearts and our minds, the more that the chaos around us doesn't overwhelm us because we know who our king is. We don't elect one every four years. He's permanent. We know who's in control. We don't have people that are deciding and voting and deciding what's going on and usually making, well, I shouldn't get into politics, but I was about to say usually making bad decisions, but I'm not even going there. But we know the one that we serve always is right and always is good and is perfectly wise and we have perfect confidence in Him and He's the one that we're trusting above all else because I'm ultimately a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so as we, as we learn to understand this and we begin to have this worldview and we begin to have this mindset and the things of the world begin to, to, to fade away, the treasures of the world begin to dim in comparison to the, to the treasures in heaven. And, and we begin to build our life around Jesus and eternity and not the temporary. And so we have this calm confidence while the world around us seems to be in chaos because we're looking more to the eternal. We're fo focusing more on the eternal than the temporary. 
So we need to raise the bar. In our Christian life. We need to listen to the Lord more than the world. Depend on the Lord more than yourself. Focus on the eternal. More than the temporary. Is there something in your personal relationship with God? Any of those areas that you need to say, man, I really need to work on that. You see, that's, that's how God is, is encouraging you to, to, to go almost from stage to stage, from level to level as you raise the bar. It's not as like you raise the bar, uh, you know, say from... If you're, if you're a high jumper and you start at four foot, you don't raise the bar to six foot. It wouldn't have mattered with me, but I mean, that's the idea is you go a little bit at a time. And in a real sense, that's the way the Christian life is. God is, is working in your life and helping you and teaching you. And, and so we're, we're learning to, to do these things in our life to, what do you need right now? What is God wanting to do, do in your life right now? He's, he's working in our lives right now and He's helping us come to a, a closer relationship with Him, a better understanding of what it means to be Christian. What's He saying to you right now? Do you need to listen to the Lord more rather than the world? Do you need to depend upon the Lord more than yourself? Do you need to focus on the eternal more than the temporary? Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you would help us to understand that you're...